in uh, recent years, there has become a uh, popular sentiment among uh, many, if it was only a very small minority, I don't guess we'd even mention it, but it's, uh, it seems to be an ever-increasing uh, number, a uh, larger uh, percentage of people who've been influenced uh, to this degree that we, I believe we need to be uh, dealing with the matter at hand. And that increasingly popular sentiment is that what used to characterize especially the preaching of brethren with explicit statements from the scripture with what we call and refer to as book chapter and verse preaching that that really is not what we need to be doing anymore as a matter of fact it might even be looked upon as an unsophisticated thing to do and of course anybody knows me then if it's got anything to do with sophistication then you can just kick it out the door because i'm not going to be doing it obviously but is that, is that really a, a, a valid argument? Is there some degree of a less amount of sophistication associated with book, chapter, and verse preaching, you know? It may be that uh, in your travels, uh, that on vacations or uh, visiting somebody here, yon, somewhere, that you may have uh, been a part of a service in which the preacher very seldom ever even mentioned a pastor scripture and if there was a pastor scripture that was mentioned it was only cited as way of reference but not quoted and thus the old uh, proverbial three-point sermons with many scriptural citations from the scripture is almost non-existent in some quarters you know now wherever this idea came from then if we could track it down and and uh, go back a few years and nip it in the bud then I think we'd be a whole lot better off but somehow this prevailing attitude is so prevalent that we even hear uh, people who are associated with the training of our young that have left the impression that young people when they hear scripture being quoted automatically they turn off they quit paying attention well now if if you started hearing that type of thing uh, say 10 to 15 years ago those young people that were turned off so-called by the simple quotation of scripture book chapter and verse preaching then those are the people now that are no longer teenagers as a matter of fact they would be the young adults and they would have kids who themselves evidently are being turned off by what's going on in the pulpit too so we got a problem a problem if people are in fact buying into this and i think if we just be perfectly honest with ourselves and honest with what we oftentimes do here in the pulpit hopefully not here but in other localities if you're visiting somewhere then you make note of the fact that there may have been little if any scriptural citation of what was said in the pulpit or maybe even very little citation of the bible in a so-called bible class hmm what about that what about that? Well, this growing mentality that has led many preachers because, you know, they want to be on the cutting edge of things, you know. They want to be up to snuff with, with the thinking of the people in the pew. And if this mentality and what's being promoted is coming from places of higher learning that are supposedly engaged in training preachers to preach, if they are removing book, chapter, and verse preaching from the teaching of preaching, then we got a problem for a long time now, don't we? If they're actually buying into this concept of non-book chapter and verse preaching. Now, I know that wasn't the case a few years ago with any schools that were associated with brethren, for sure. But is it increasingly so among some? Well, hopefully it's not but a few. But if it's any, then that's too many in reality, and we'll prove that to be the case. And it's less, not just because I think that we could do no better than to saturate our sermons with the thus saith the Lord and with book, chapter, and verse preaching, but because there's good, reasonable explanation as to why that what, that's what we ought to be doing. But you know as well as I that there are some people who will feel more comfortable and will feel more at ease in quoting some famous theologian or some new philosophy or some new sociological idea rather than quoting Peter or Jesus or Paul. You know, why is that? 
And is it really that detrimental to what we're all about, you know? Is this just a, another way of looking at things that doesn't have any adverse consequences associated with it? it? And it's just because it's different than what I would do that I would bring it up. Because if I was in that other camp, you know, then I wouldn't be bringing it up. Is that what it amounts to, you know? It's, it's me saying, well, if we can't do it like I want to do it, then let's not do it at all. Is, is that the idea? Well, that's not the idea. Obviously not. But we know for a fact that there are many people who are getting further and further away from the Scripture. Is there a reason behind that? And why is it the case that people are in fact doing this? And all you got to do is look at a few biblical examples to see that when people take this approach to or have this mentality towards God's Word, then it always puts them in a position of setting them up for future destruction. It always does. I mean, think about our devotional read just a few minutes ago. In Deuteronomy chapter 6. What is the context of Deuteronomy chapter 6? Well, you have a renewed nation of Israelites. Renewed in the sense that discipline has been exacted upon all the older people. Except for Joshua and Caleb. Of their generation, there's the only two that lived. And here is a new group of people the kids, the grandkids, the nieces, and the nephews of all those complaining. Israelites who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until they died. And now you've got the younger people who are going in to the land that flows with milk and honey, the land of promise. They're going in and they're going to be populating cities and living in towns that have walls around them that they didn't have anything to do with building. They're going to be eating out of vineyards that they didn't have anything to do with planting. They're going to be eating fine vegetables out of gardens that they didn't have anything to do with putting out and toiling to put those gardens out. And the specific things that are going to result in their success are spelled out in detail as how he read for us a few moments ago. Listen to what he says as we read it again, Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning verse 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Now what is it that's going to be in your heart? These words which I command thee this day. Now whose words are those? Well, those are Moses' words. Well, whose words are they really? Well, they're really God's words that are being revealed through Moses, the great lawgiver. That's whose words. It's God's word that they've got to keep in their heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Teach them what? Their own ideas? Uh, public opinion? The cutting edge of societal evolution? <laughs> no. No, teach them God's words. You'll teach those things to thy children, and you'll talk of them. Talk of what? Talk of the latest fad in the field of psychology? No, it's still God's word. You'll talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Sounds like that the central topic of conversation in the family that God has designed for Israel is God's Word all the time. Now, that don't mean they don't talk about, well, who won the football game last night or, or uh, did you make an A on your math test? Or, but what's important is their topic of discussion in the morning, the noon, the night, when they go to bed at night, when they get up in the morning while they're walking by the way, what's going to be the prevailing factor in order for these homes of these Israelites to be successful is God's Word has to be at the center of it. Now, how's it going to get there? Are they going to just spend time and, and start humming, you know, and, and hope that it sort of drifts into their ears and then they can put a stop over their ears and hold it, hold it in? Is that the way it's going to work? If it worked for them, then could we do something like that today? Well, of course not. It's not like that, is it? You'll bind them as a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them on the post of thy house and on thy gates. You see, in order for the children of Israel to be successful in this new venture that they are blessed to be a part of in taking over the land of Canaan and, and removing all of the heathen inhabitants therein and be successful... Up to, they are carried away into captivity first by the Assyrians to the north and the Babylonians to the south, will be adhering to what God has said. And if somebody comes upon the scene and says, you know what, 
Young people don't like to hear book, chapter, and verse preaching. Young people don't want to hear what God has to say because when you start saying, Moses said this, then that turns people off. Well, they'll just have to get turned off because that's what they need to hear. That's the only thing that will provide them what they need to face the future. Now, that's the way it was then. And brethren, that's exactly the way it is today. All the philosophical and uh, sociological ideas that man can muster will not come close to equating with what God has said to direct us in this life in which we live. Notice as well as the book of Psalms begins. Psalm 1, verse 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law doth he meditate day and night. Now how is this guy so favored, so blessed and happy? Well, it's because he's not spending time with evil people, but he is spending time with God's Word. And in the absence of spending that time with God's Word, he cannot be the contentedly happy man that he is. He's identified as a contentedly happy man because he is meditating upon God's Word day and night. And I submit that in order for you to be able to meditate on God's Word day and night, then you've got to know what God's Word is first. Because you can't meditate upon something you don't know. They had to know God's Word. Another example, on time, uh, the time that the northern kingdom of Israel is fixing to be taken into captivity, one of the problems they faced is addressed in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed. Why? Because they did not keep up with the latest fads in the philosophical world? No. It's because they had rejected a knowledge of God's word. That's why. And because they had rejected a knowledge of God's word, God said, I will also reject thee. And I'll, that you'll be no priest to me. And because you would not do my bidding, then your children will also be cut off. And all this is the result of what? A rejection of what God had to say. In this brief lesson this evening, we're going to look at at least four different areas that hopefully will reinforce the notion that we need to not only be satisfied with, but we must demand book, chapter, and preaching. And there's a reason why that is the case. Now you'll just notice even this morning, you remember uh, how that I had a hard time remembering uh, the citation of the proper place in which Paul and Barnabas went into Iconium? You just, no, I said Acts chapter 4. I said no, Acts chapter 5, no. Acts chapter 15, no. I, well, it was Acts chapter 14, of all things. I'd assume I'd got there pretty soon, you know. Acts chapter 14. And we may notice specifically in Acts chapter 14 that Paul and Barnabas, when they got into the city of Iconium, they both, they both, that's both those two preachers, went into the synagogue of the Jews and they so spake. What did they speak? The latest fads in the field of psychology? No. Did they repeat what they had heard on Dr. Phil? Not hardly. They spoke the truth of the gospel so much so that lost Jews and lost Gentiles found out just exactly what they needed to do in order to be saved. The manner of their preaching was such that they had no trouble understanding what their position was before God without the gospel. And it caused them to want to do something about it. That's the kind of preaching that we must have today. It's that same type of preaching. Notice number one. When you preach book, chapter, and verse preaching, then you're helping your hearers learn the Bible. Duh. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? When you are preaching book, chapter, and verse, then you're helping those who are hearing you preach learn the Bible. Obviously so. Well, what are they learning if you're not preaching book, chapter, and verse preaching? Well, if they are learning the Bible, they don't really know that they are because there are no citations from the Bible in what they're hearing. It may be the Bible, but there's no way they can check it out if they are not given citation as to what you're saying. How many times has it been the case 
that some biblical concept, some biblical principle needed to be reinforced with book, chapter, and verse so that people could see that the reason why they believe this, that, or the other is because it's tied directly to this particular passage of Scripture, to this particular historical event that is recorded for us in Scripture. That's what God's Word gives us the ability to do. But in the absence of doing that, then we can't really know why we believe what we believe or why we disbelieve what we refuse to believe, you see. One, a person learns and is capable then of memorizing passages of Scripture when they learn to memorize and learn those passages of Scripture themselves. Remember, the example is given in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts of the Bereans being classified as being more noble than those in Thessalonica. How so? Well, they searched the Scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was so. Now, here's what they had the ability to do. Here's Paul, and he's preaching about Jesus being the resurrected from the dead Messiah. And they had it there, uh, had handy with them God's Word where they could check out Paul and make sure that Paul is, in fact, telling them the truth. Is that not sort of like we tell everybody to do all the time here? Sure. Whether it's visitors or whether it's members. We say, do not accept what's said from this pulpit just because it's being said from the pulpit. Accept it because you have examined what was said with your Bible open and based upon what your own eyes see the Bible to teach, that's what you've got to believe. Not what I say, but what the Bible says. That's where our faith must rest. There's an example, remember, in the, uh, the case of uh, the rich man who died along with Lazarus in uh, Luke chapter 16 that when the rich man wanted to send Lazarus to warn his brothers not to come to this terrible place, you remember what Father Abraham said? He said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. <coughs> now there's, a, there's a, a, a keen insight into what someone on the other side says to those on this side. Are you concerned about your soul? Hear God's word. Pay attention to what God That's exactly what he's saying. Abraham says, if those brothers of yours, Mr. Rich Man, if they want to enjoy salvation, they've got Moses and the prophets. Let them do what you should have done about Moses and the prophets. They've got the opportunity to do it. If they're not accountable, God won't hold them accountable, but they are probably accountable, and they're accountable to know what Moses and the prophets says. Let them hear them. Well, what would those in the Hadean realm tell us today? Hear Moses and the prophets? Well, of course not. But you better heed the gospel, that's for sure. We know just exactly what we're required to pay attention to based upon the principle here of Luke chapter 16 and verse 29. And then, remember, as Paul encouraged this young preacher by the name of Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Now, the idea here of reading would include your own private reading of the Scriptures, but more than likely, it has reference to the public reading of Scriptures. Give attendance. In other words, make it a high priority to read God's Word together. That's not a time when we can try to locate our Bible or where we're supposed to be in our Bible class. That's not a time to be choosing what songs we want to sing uh, later on that day. That's not a time to be uh, doing a thousand other things. What we're supposed to be doing when we're giving attendance to reading is reading. It's hearing what God's Word says. And notice it's given attendance to reading what? The latest issue of psychology today? Well, of course not. Give attendance to reading God's inspired word. If a preacher doesn't use and he doesn't identify scripture in his sermon, then he's obviously contributing to people in the audience staying ignorant of where the scripture is talking about. As a matter of fact, he might be the very one who's contributing to a detrimental effect of the hearers who want to know where this passage is cited that he keeps making reference to. Notice secondly, quoting scripture and requiring of preachers that if they use direct citation will minimize the tendency oftentimes that people have to generalize, to generalize. You know how those generalizations oftentimes go? 
You'll be studying with somebody and say, where is that passage of Scripture? Well, it's in there somewhere. I know I've read it. Well, let's find it. Let's find it. We'll take a time out right here and you hunt for it. You can call somebody and see if they can find it too. At our little so-called debate that we had, you know, we kept asking over and over and over again, where's that passage of Scripture at, Andrew? The debate ended and Andrew still hadn't found that passage. Now, he had had a whole day to himself where he could have called everybody he knew. He could have gone and Googled it if he wanted to. He could have gone to the library and got all types of books to find this so-called pastor scripture that he knew was there. But the scripture was not in there. It wasn't in there. But when you use book, chapter, and verse preaching, then you cannot have that generalization that leads to false concepts and false ideas. And sometimes people will put together words that are a part of Scripture, but they actually don't have anything to do with what they're trying to get you to believe. In other words, they're disguising what they're saying, which is error, false doctrine, and they're using biblical terms to lead the naive person into accepting that what they're saying is true. But it's not. It's not. When you are actually given book, chapter, and verse for what you're saying, people in the pew can check you out and make sure that what you are saying is in fact what the scriptures are. And what's interesting to me is that even when Bible writers quoted scripture, you know what they most of the time didn't, didn't do? They said, well, I know it's somewhere in there. It's in there somewhere, you know. No, they were very careful to quote it directly as it was. Know some examples. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, which is a direct quotation from Psalm 8. Hebrews chapter 2. But one in a certain place testify. Now, obviously, the Hebrew writer here does not identify David as being the writer of the book of Psalms, especially Psalm 8. And notice what he says. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. Thou set him over the works of thy hand. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Well, that sounds just like Psalm 8. You see, even inspired men saw the need to quote specifically what was said in the Old Testament passage that they are alluding to and making an application of. Another example in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6. The Hebrew writer says, And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. As he again quotes from the book of Psalm, Psalm 110 at verse 4, a direct quotation. We just wish that our religious friends and neighbors would be so careful in their quoting of passages of Scripture as these inspired men were. But oftentimes it is the case that the deceptions that the denominational world comes up with or the deceptions that our own false brethren promote and expect people to accept are oftentimes used with those who are naive and don't even know what the scriptures say. Here is what we something we've said oftentimes and it remains true. If we do not know what the Bible teaches, how is it going to be possible for us to identify what the Bible doesn't teach? How? Yeah. You see, then it'll be based upon, well, you know, that, 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 that didn't sound too bad. No, unless you know what the Bible teaches, and then it sounds like a direct contradiction, you know. Well, you know, he smiled and seemed so, so loving and kind. Yeah, but what he said was a direct affront to the Lord himself and what the Lord said, you see. If we know what the Bible actually teaches, and we can put our finger on it, then that places us in the position where we're able to see and comprehend that which is false. That which is false. Notice also, direct scripture quotation impresses upon the hearer that the preacher is not the one that needs to be listened to because the message does not come of him. It's God's message. And the principle is listen to God. Yeah, that's it. There's nothing that a gospel preacher says that originates with the gospel preacher. You know. It originates with the God who gave and made possible the gospel, you know. For no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know, 
The message didn't originate with the, those prophets. The message originated with God's. And since that is the case, then it's God's Word that has the power. It's God's Word that has the capabilities. It's God's Word that can change a lost sinner into a saved person on the way to glory. It's not the words of the preacher. And you know what's amazing, too, is that even in the academic fields, uh, if you go to college and you write a term paper or something, you are held responsible for documenting just exactly who it is that you're quoting from. Now, let's tell you something. If the preachers of the Sequatchie Valley were held to that standard, they would not have anything to say week after week because they cannot document God's Word for what they want you to swallow, hook, line, and sinker. They can't do it. They might find it in a manual or a church uh, confession of faith or something, but it will not be located in God's Word because it cannot be documented there. Fourth and finally, giving here sufficient information for them to locate the passage of Scripture is appropriate because that's just exactly what Jesus and the rest of the, the, rest of the preachers of the Bible did. Who is our example of what preaching is supposed to be? You know, is it famous preachers that we have known over the last two or three generations? You know? Is it some preacher that we happen to get a, a sermon outline book from that we thought a whole lot of, or at least grandma or grandpa thought a whole lot of them, and they give us that sermon outline book? Or is it the preachers that we can read about in the Bible? Well, hopefully it's those that we can read about in the Bible. And if those preachers that we've had the opportunity to hear were anything at all, then they were simply quoting and were preaching after that example of those in the scripture themselves as well. Now keep in mind, obviously, that when we say that the preachers of the Bible use this very method in their preaching, the book chapter or the verse and chapter divisions that we have available to us today were not available to them. But they could locate for the benefit of narrowing down where they were talking about when they were preaching. Take the, ex the example of the sermon that was preached by Peter and the rest of the apostles in Acts chapter 2. Some 65% of the sermon that's recorded for us in Acts chapter 2 is direct quotations from the Old Testament. You can't have too much Bible in your sermon. Now, according to some people's thinking, you can. But according to the instruction and the example of God's preachers in the Bible, you cannot do any better than to have sermons filled with scriptural citations. Now, obviously, today, we're not in the same position exactly that those in the first century were. I mean, here you got, here you got apostles and preachers of the first century that for uh, the most part were trying to teach and uh, help to see the fact that the promised Messiah that they had been told about for so long had actually been fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ, you know. So they're dealing with people who had at least a, uh, a rough understanding of Old Testament passages and Old Testament scripture. But friends, think about this. We don't deal with people today that know their Bible hardly at all. So if there ever was a time for us to be able to fill, to fill our teaching and our sermons with Scripture so that people might be able to go to those passages and find out what we're saying, it's now when people don't know the difference from the Old and the New Testament. They would be just as likely to look for the book of Hezekiah as they were to look for the book of Hebrews in their Bible. Now that's sad, but that is the case as well. And think about this too. One of the reasons why more people have not continued this practice of filling their sermons with Scripture is because they can't. They can't. They can't do it. They don't know the Bible enough to quote it. They don't know the Bible enough that they can accurately teach others what the Bible clearly teaches. And so it takes effort. It takes planning for them to be able to successfully and adequately present the gospel with a knowledge of what they're saying that actually applies the principles of Scripture to the situations that we're dealing with. And because people are lazy, generally speaking, and not willing to put forth the effort, they'd rather keep on telling stories and telling you about the latest things that are being accepted as true in the fields of philosophy and psychology and sociology.
sad, sad indeed. Don't ever, ever feel as though that we need to back away from book, chapter, and verse preaching. It has the unique ability of saving the souls of those that are lost. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. And let's never, ever, ever forget it nor downplay the prominence of Scripture in our lives and in our presentation of the gospel. It may be that in our audience this evening, there are those who've never obeyed that simple gospel plan, have never been added to the body of Christ by the Lord as they've never been baptized into Christ where all spiritual blessings are found. You've been blessed with an opportunity this evening that you can become a child of God. You can become just exactly what they became on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. That's the way the Lord has been added to his church since that day and will continue to do that until he returns again. Why not allow the Lord to add you to his church this evening in obedience to the gospel? Maybe in times past, having done that, you've wandered away. Why not come back home through repentance, confession, and prayer? We'll seek to encourage you through the words of the song that's been selected. Would you come while we stand and while we sing?